On a warm October night in 2009, a taxi driver receives a concerning dispatch call. They mention the fare had locked herself in the bathroom, specifically waiting for a female driver. Cautiously pulling into the motel parking lot, the driver faces the room number she was given. Just as instructed, she starts honking her horn and flashing her lights, a practice not uncommon at Saville Motor Lodge, a motel synonymous with prostitution. But no one's coming out. After a few tense minutes of honking, the door finally opens, revealing a large man. When he sees the headlights pointing straight at him, he tries to cover his face with his arms and runs towards an SUV on the side street. Not far behind, an extremely petite girl comes running out of the room towards the taxi. She jumps inside, tears flowing, hands shaking. The driver didn't ask the girl's name, but when she eventually saw the picture on TV, she knew this was Shannon Gilbert. Safely inside the taxi, Shannon expressed her gratitude and began explaining the details of how she got in this dangerous situation. She was a sex worker who used Craigslist, and this is how the large man from the motor lodge befriended her. He knew Shannon and her family were struggling financially, so he told her he would take care of them all. That October night, the man got her to come out to Long Island, a place she told the taxi driver they were always calling her to come out, and she expressed her displeasure with the area. Once inside the motel room, she said the man gave her a thick envelope and told her whatever happens, it's for her and her family. But she noticed something strange in his face as he said this. Rage. So when the large man entered the bathroom, Shannon took the chance to look in the envelope, and what she found sent shivers down her spine. The envelope was filled with torn up pieces of paper. Now once the man came out of the bathroom, he began acting extremely agitated and aggressive, started shaking Shannon back and forth. And having no idea what this man was capable of, she quickly got out of his grasp, ran into the bathroom, locked the door, and called for the taxi. Between the parking lots at Saville Motor Lodge and Ron Concoma Station, where Shannon was catching a train back to New York City, they sat and talked for about an hour or two. But with a couple hours before Shannon's train would arrive and more fares to pick up, the driver suggested Shannon wait with a friend who was at the station. The taxi driver departed for the night, having no idea who she had gotten involved with. And I don't mean Shannon. A few months later, on May 1st, 2010, Shannon went to meet a client that she met through Craigslist out in Oak Beach, a community a few miles east of Gilgo Beach. Michael Pack was her driver and security, and they had worked together before, with Pack getting half of the money Shannon would bring in. But according to Pack, he was not her pimp. So they arrive at the client's house, Joe Brewer. Shannon enters, and Pack drives around the neighborhood waiting for her. Inside the house, sex and money are exchanged, and then at some point during the meeting, Brewer calls Pack to come get Shannon because he says she's acting irrationally. This is when Shannon makes her infamous call to 911. Her call lasted over 20 minutes, so I'll only be including relevant clips, but if you are interested in the complete unedited versions of all three 911 calls, check the link at the end of the video. Only a few seconds into the call, we can hear Shannon saying, Yeah, there's somebody asking me. I'm sorry? There's somebody asking me. Where are you? There's somebody asking me. Okay, where are you? There's somebody asking me. Where are you, ma'am? She doesn't know where she is and asks for the call to be traced, which they can't do. Now, during this, we can hear her arguing with Brewer, the client, as he tries to get her to leave. Please, can you the door? No, time to go. Please. 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 Then he starts getting a bit more aggressive as she starts screaming. At this point, Pack arrives and Brewer says, But when Pack tries to talk to her, Shannon asks, and after a second operator joins, we hear her tell Pack, oh, You're being sarcastic about this. You were part of this all along. I have met him just now. He continues trying to get through to her while she tells him, I just want to go home. Something's going to happen to me. Now, through all of this, the operators are fighting to communicate with her. Either she's forgetting she's on the call, or maybe she's hiding it. Okay, okay. Fine. Get out of here. What's in the phone? However, she does sound like she's on something because she's slurring her words and she can't answer easy questions. After a few minutes, she once again repeats. These people are fine to kill me. <laughs> Following this exchange, the call plunges into silence, broken only by the operator's persistent effort to get a response. 
After three eerie minutes, Shannon smashes the silence, bursting out of the house, screaming. The sound of her footsteps reverberating through the Oak Beach community. She frantically knocks on a couple doors, and by this point it's 5 o'clock in the morning, by the way, and comes upon the helpful Gus Coletti. Unaware she's already on a call, I'm guessing her phone is in her pocket, Gus tries to assist by calling 911, but he's interrupted by Shannon once again running away. We hear Shannon run off Gus's property, and that's where her call cuts out but not where the story ends. As Shannon's running, he gets through to 911 and tells them, There's a young girl about 14 years old running around here screaming, and there's some guy trying to follow her. He was into like a, a suburban. Now, Shannon was very petite, which is why he thought she was so young, but I mean 14, come on. And the SUV was Pac's car, so he was the one chasing her, obviously. Running south, Shannon arrives at 43 The Bayou, the owner, Barbara Brennan, hears her panic knocks and cries for help. But upon getting no response when asking who the girl knocking is, Barbara gets worried, triggering a third 911 call. Some woman is knocking at my door. She says she's in danger. Do you know her or no? No, I don't. I'm not letting her in. She then hangs up and quickly calls her neighbors, asking them to come by for help. And when she hangs up again, Shannon's gone. This would be the final recorded interaction with Shannon that night. Her neighbors come by to have a look and report back to Barbara what they saw. Shannon's wet footprints went west down Barbara's walkway towards the beach. When police arrived, Pac and Shannon were gone, so they thought Pac may have chased her out of Oak Beach, and apparently that's why they didn't initially search the area. It wouldn't be for about a year until Shannon's body was found in the marsh east of the gated community. Officially, it's thought that Shannon made her way into the marsh in a drug-induced panic and traveled along this trench made for mosquito control. With the brush so high, she couldn't find her way out and tragically drowned. And according to Suffolk County, that's what happened on Shannon Gilbert's last night. But there's a few head scratchers in this call we gotta wonder about. As we could hear from the call, 100% she was on something. The question is whether she took those drugs of her own volition. Second, she kept repeating there after me and told her driver, You are part of this all along. Is this the same they from when she told the taxi driver they are always calling me out to Long Island? And maybe most confusing, why did she keep running when 911 was being called? Mary Gilbert is Shannon's mother, and she was convinced her daughter's death was no accident. I mean, the 911 call had her daughter saying someone was after her. Mary also suspected mishandling of the case due to Shannon being a sex worker. This is evident of the fact that they only found Shannon because she was in close proximity to the bodies of the Gilgo Four. And they were only found because an off-duty cop was on dog duty and found the body by accident. They weren't even searching. And if you caught the last video, you know the force at the time was steeped in corruption. So really, Mary was not wrong. In order to dig a little deeper, Mary hired lawyer John Ray, and he uncovered some troubling inconsistencies surrounding Shannon's death. First, she was initially discovered belly up, which is extremely unusual for someone who drowned. Second, her personal belongings and clothes were found scattered in the marsh far from her body. Both these things suggest that her body was carried there. And since the cops ruled death as accidental, lawyer John Ray hired Michael Baden, an independent forensic pathologist, to do a second autopsy on Shannon. He found that her hyoid bone, it's a small curved bone in your throat, was deformed. And what that means is there could have been some strangulation there. However, Without access to Shannon's soft tissue, he could not make a definitive determination. After the initial autopsy done by the police, her soft tissue was boiled away, which sounds like something a fucking serial killer would do, but apparently this is a fairly common identifying procedure. The thing is, Baden said that he didn't think it was necessary in this case. That's all more than enough evidence to be skeptical already. But there was one thing that sparked Mary's suspicions more than anything else from the very beginning. A phone call. Meet Dr. Charles Peter Hackett. At various points in his career, he was an emergency room doctor, the head of Suffolk County EMS, and, big surprise, a police surgeon at the same time the administration was in power. And we know what that means for his moral standing. When deposed, he stated that he owned a DEA license, and that's a designation that allowed him to prescribe different opiates. 
Hackett also admitted that he regularly consumed the cocktail of opiates and other drugs that he had access to. Not exactly what you want in a police surgeon. And according to the locals, Hackett was a semi-drug dealer. In all probability, he was dealing to the force. They were known for planting drugs, doing drugs. Burke was found with drugs years later in prison. I mean, I think the drug connection is about as subtle as the jokes in Scary Movie. Now, you might think you know where I'm going with this. And you probably do. So, what about that call? Well, Mary claimed that on May 3rd, two days after Shannon's disappearance, she received a call from a man who introduced himself as Peter Hackett. According to Mary, this is how the conversation went. My name is Peter Hackett. I live in Long Island. I run a halfway house for wayward girls, girls that want to get off the street, and Shannon was here. I was trying to help her. Mary asks how he got her number, and he replies, It's part of my rules in the house. I have all my girls give me family numbers in case there's an emergency. And he says, I'm worried about her. She left with a man named Michael Pack. He promised to bring her back, and she's not back yet. I'm worried about her. I want to help her. If you hear from Shannon, if she calls you, if she comes to your house, I'm going to give you my number. Have her call me. I'm worried about her. Remember, he wasn't a friend of the family or anything, so that was already really fucking weird. But then when Hackett was questioned about the call, he denied ever calling Mary. All of this was obviously incredibly suspicious, and Mary, who had always believed there was foul play involved, was now beginning to get vocal in her belief that Hackett was responsible for Shannon's death. She publicly accused him of Shannon's murder and filed a wrongful death suit against him later that year. And because she did that, everyone involved got deposed. And first up is Peter Hackett himself. The first thing they looked into was the call. And when phone records were obtained, he was right. He didn't make a call to Mary. He made two, three days apart. So why the initial denial? Well, during the deposition, he said he didn't remember. And then he gave an entirely different account of events. It turns out Peter Hackett lived in Oak Beach, the area Shannon went missing. So he said Shannon's driver, Michael Pack, and boyfriend Alex Diaz were going around the area talking to everybody, trying to get more information, and came to his Oak Beach house to ask him a favor. He said that Diaz was trying to get Mary Gilbert to turn the service back on for Shannon's phone, which apparently had been turned off by her sister Sherry. Hackett remembers saying, this is something for someone other than me to be doing, but I'll be happy to do it, which for someone who isn't even a family friend is really fucking weird. Now this is Hackett's account of the phone call. I'm Dr. Hackett. I'm a member. I live at Oak Beach. I met Alex and Mr. Pack today. We had a conversation about putting up posters and that worked out. The main thing is Alex wanted me to ask you to please turn on Shannon's telephone. That's it. He said he didn't remember if he said anything else or how she responded to any of what he said. Thing is, no transcripts exist, so no one knows what was actually said or why he really called. But like I mentioned, everyone got deposed, and I'll tell you, these transcripts have more lies than my resume. First is the most obvious lie, the fact that he denied calling and then it was proven that he called twice. Then there's two completely different versions of the conversation. He also claimed that Diaz called him before coming to the house, but phone records show that no call was ever made. Brewer, Shannon's client from that night, said that when he met Hackett, he saw him standing at his front gate talking with Diaz. But Hackett denied meeting with or talking to Brewer ever in his entire life. There was even an affidavit allegedly signed by Barbara Brennan on behalf of Hackett, but when deposed, she had no recollection of ever being presented or signing any such document. There are literally hundreds of inconsistencies listed throughout this document. After Mary went public with her beliefs and accusations, the media latched on. This prompted Hackett to sell his house on Long Island and move to Florida, where years later he said he was basically unemployable. There's even a Netflix movie about Shannon Gilbert portraying him as the main suspect. And this clip of a reporter questioning him about Shannon shows the extent to which he wanted to get away from this story. So you never ran a home for wayward girls? Nope. And you had nothing to do with Shannon Gilbert's death? That's correct. What about all the other girls? Fire! Jesus Christ! <laughs> what was that? I defibrillator. You Who sons you of bitches. No, right don't. Now. No, it's all right. No. I'm a doctor. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm sorry for laughing. But we got to get serious again because we are getting to the meat and potatoes of this uh, potato salad. So we have some more questions. Was there a house for wayward girls? 
Why did he call Mary in the first place? Did the boyfriend really ask him to or was there another reason? And most importantly, was Hackett really involved in Shannon's death? Sadly, Mary didn't live to see any of these questions answered. See, Shannon had a sister named Sarah who lived in the same apartment building. Sarah had very severe psychological issues, schizophrenia being one of them, and it was being treated with medicine prescribed to her. However, she shared a dangerous problem with her sister, illegal drug use. And a few years after Shannon's disappearance, perhaps brought upon by the disappearance itself, Sarah stopped taking the medicine prescribed and started self-medicating. She became increasingly convinced that her mother and sisters were possessed by demons. And on July 23rd, 2016, she called her mother Mary in a desperate panic, saying she was hearing voices and needed help. And being a mother, Mary walked over to Sarah's apartment wanting to help however she could. And when Mary entered, Sarah unleashed a frenzied attack, stabbing her mother over 200 times with a kitchen knife. She then bludgeoned her with a fire extinguisher, sprayed her with the foam, removed her clothes, and took all of her jewelry. And tragically, Mary's valiant fight for justice came to an end on that fateful day. Now, let's delve into some of the questionable details that we've come across so far. First, let's look at Shannon's last night. The 911 call, why did she make it in the first place? Second, her demeanor on that call. Was she on drugs? And if so, did she take them of her own volition? Next is the fact that she kept saying they. They are after me. You're with them. Told the taxi driver they are always calling me out to Long Island. Next, why did she keep running every time 911 was being called? The details of her death were also questionable. Why were her belongings found so far from her and why was she face up? And lastly, why was the hyoid bone in her throat deformed? Now let's explore questions surrounding Hackett. First, and most obvious, the call to Mary. Why did he really call? And why did he call twice? Next, is there really a house for wayward girls? And what did in his care mean? Drugs? After all, he was a drug dealer. And lastly, as a police surgeon, he was part of an intensely corrupt police force in Suffolk County, involved in cases of evidence tampering and witness intimidation, among other things. The most obvious theory is that this was an accidental death. See, back when Diaz and Pac talked to Hackett, Diaz mentioned Shannon's drug problems, specifically with cocaine, how over the years he talked to her about not using it because she has bad reactions to it. He also said she's gone missing many times before and has had semi-psychiatric behavior, but that she's never really gone nuts. Shannon could have taken drugs, possibly cocaine, then gone out on a job way too high. Couple that with her mental state and she could have started freaking out and getting paranoid. She then could have called the cops thinking someone was after her, and in this paranoia ran from her driver pack who she knew. Since she was in a panic and an unfamiliar place, she may have run into the marsh, couldn't find a way out, and drowned in the peculiar state she was found, just like the cops reported. It would explain the 911 call with a drug-induced paranoia. The drugs would also explain why she was slurring her words and unable to communicate. And if the drugs triggered a state of panic, it may explain the strange way she was found face up belongings far from her body. However, it does not explain most of the other questions we have, so let's keep digging. So how does Hackett connect to all of this? And what about the house for wayward girls? Maybe the answer has been staring at us in the face from the very beginning. Sayville Motor Lodge was the motel Shannon called a taxi from in the beginning of our story. And from the outside, this was a standard roadside motel sitting on Sunrise Highway, but inside, Dealers were allowed to sell drugs in their rooms with customers getting high on heroin, cocaine, and crack all in plain view. Sex traffickers were supplied with rooms out of plain view of police and would be warned if law enforcement was seen. Girls were kept addicted to drugs while abuse and violence was ignored. This place was fucked. What if the home for wayward girls was Sayville Motor Lodge? Maybe Hackett's version of helping girls get off the street was really keeping girls addicted to his narcotics in the motel to keep making him money. We know she was susceptible to offers of aid from her interaction with Hewerman. We also know she had a problem with drugs and cocaine specifically from her boyfriend Diaz. What if Shannon Gilbert was being trafficked by Peter Hackett? Hold on to your butts. This is only a theory of what may have happened. At Sayville Motor Lodge, Hackett instructs Shannon to go out on a job to Brewer's house in Oak Beach, but not before supplying driver Pack with narcotics. Shannon and Pack drive to Brewer's house, and before she goes in, Pack gives her some of the drugs he received from Hackett. Shannon enters the house where sex is exchanged for money, but during the visit, she starts feeling uneasy from the drugs she was given. 
and knows that something isn't right. If she goes with Pack, she knows she'll just end up back at the lodge, which is a death sentence. So in a haze, she dials 911. But as the operator answers, the drugs Hackett gave her render her unable to communicate what she needs. With Saville Motor Lodge in her mind, she says things like, These people are fine to kill me. She even implores, I just want to go home. She knows he's going to take her back to the lodge, and she tells him, You're a part of this all along. Remember that three-minute gap of silence in Shannon's 911 call right before she ran out of the house screaming? Perhaps the call went on for so long, Pack from another room informed Hackett of the situation. And Hackett, not wanting to attract attention to himself or the lodge, could have ordered Pack to take care of her. Shannon could have heard the conversation or seen the same look in Pack's eyes that she saw in Rex Hureman that one night and run for her life. She ran out the door screaming. She ran to Gus Coletti's house but fled when Pack showed up looking for her. She knew Hackett was connected to the police force and could have been worried that the wrong cop may show up if someone else talked to 911. That may explain why she ran from Barbara Brennan's house after being told that 911 was being called. But maybe she wasn't running from 911. Shannon ran from Gus's property as he called 911, but it was also when Pax showed up chasing her. The same thing could have happened at Barbara's house because she wasn't watching what was happening outside while she was on the phone with her neighbors. Barbara Brennan stated that Shannon's footprints went west down her walkway, which led to the ocean, but she was found hundreds of feet east in the marsh. Perhaps Pack finally caught up with her at 43 the Bayou during Barbara's call. He could have then carried her into Hackett's house, not far away, for further instructions. But if Hackett didn't want anything to do with it and just said he wanted her gone, Pack could have carried a drugged Shannon into the marsh. She could have been fighting him along the way, causing her to drop her belongings 30 yards from Hackett's house where they were found. He could have carried her east along the Mosquito Trench, and when he felt they had gone far enough, Pack, at Hackett's command, could have strangled Shannon to death. A grim theory for sure, but it fits pretty much every facet of this disturbing, confusing case. Everything we already covered, plus Hackett being a drug dealer, the house for wayward girls, the administration ruling Shannon's death accidental, they would have wanted to cover up for their friend Hackett. It explains why she kept running from the cops. She knew they were involved in Saville Motor Lodge. Why she kept saying, they are after me, thought Pack was part of the whole thing. It would also fit Shannon's problems with drug use and desire to help her family. It even fits the details surrounding her death, her belongings being dropped along the way, her hyoid bone being deformed from strangulation, and being found face up because she was dropped there. Even Hackett's second call to Mary can be explained by him wanting to know if the police told her any new details that may worry him. It really is the theory that fits this entire puzzle, but there's still one piece that we left out. One piece that makes this theory even darker than it already is. So be prepared. Everything in the previous theory rings true for this one. We're just adding on to it. Remember, after Shannon's death, Mary publicly accused Hackett of Shannon's murder. And we know from the fact that he immediately moved and his behavior on camera ah! that he was sick of Mary ruining his reputation. Even in Florida, years later, he said he was basically unemployable. Mary also publicly accused Suffolk County PD of mishandling the case, and the administration were already keeping the FBI at bay. They didn't want to attract attention either. They also had a history of doing a lot of dirty things to people that tried to expose their corruption, and they may have been looking for a way to tie up loose ends. Perhaps when Hackett was supplying Shannon with drugs, he also formed a relationship with Sarah, Shannon's sister. Sarah stopped taking her meds and started self-medicating in the years after Shannon's disappearance, but maybe it had less to do with grief and more to do with manipulation. Maybe Hackett got her started and the administration kept her going after Hackett moved, all in an effort to silence Mary by triggering Sarah's psychiatric disorders in a horrific way. Maybe he was aware of Sarah's delusions about her family being demons and was feeding that exact delusion. And one day, after years of drug-induced manipulation, years after Hackett instructed Pack to get rid of Shannon in the marsh, Sarah finally snapped in the exact way they were hoping and attacked her own mother, closing all loose ends. A depressing thought for sure, but it fits too perfectly not to share with you all. Please remember this is all for entertainment, none of these theories are accusations, it's just a thought experiment. But if this is what happened, then just before all the corruption was wiped out of Suffolk County, the force may have successfully silenced all voices speaking against them. But there's one voice that won't be silenced, the voice of John Ray, lawyer for the Gilbert family. 
No matter what you think of this guy, he hasn't stopped fighting since Shannon's disappearance. In fact, he's still fighting to this day, and he recently released some new information. We're going to take a look at all of that and possible connections next time as we continue to question everything about the Long Island serial murders. If you want the unedited 911 calls from that night, check out this video. And if you want to catch up on the entire Deep Dive series, check out this playlist. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Let me know what topics you want to see in the future.